Um, so, uh, so this is a very, very early stage of the project. There is a uh, workshop version of the paper that I'm happy to send to anybody who's interested. You can, you can drop me a note. I wasn't comfortable putting it up on the website for the my relatives and my dean and the whole world to see at this point. Uh, but uh, I would look forward both to your comments uh, after the presentation here and to anything you'd like to, to give me if you would like to uh, look at a longer version. Um, uh, this follows on from, from Chris's presentation uh, a little bit. Um, uh, I think the best entry point here, the best entry point I can think of is uh, the rather large literature on authorship. Chris, Chris says there wasn't much, but I think he's talking about sort of doctrinal or constitutional analysis. So it's actually a pretty big literature that has been around for a while trying to think about uh, what is authorship, what does authorship mean? Most of you are familiar with uh, Peter Yasin and Martha Whitmansay and Fred Yen and Jessica Lippmann and the others who've written about uh, legacy assumptions in, in copyright, uh, things that were baked in uh, literally centuries ago, uh, concepts like the romantic author, the idea that there's a single, a single genius who uh, develops these things that should be uh, copyrightable. Lots of work uh, making that sort of a postmodern target uh, for deconstruction, uh, saying, well, actually, the audience has a lot to do with infusing that with meaning. Uh, actually, uh, authors uh, don't create uh, from nothing. Uh, they have to draw from existing sources, uh, and sort of unpacking what all of that means. Um, I'm adding, I think, a new thread to that conversation, uh, which is what I'm interested in is, are there legacy assumptions that are baked into our copyright system having to do with narrative. Uh, and uh, there are people here who know far more about that than I do, which is why I'm looking forward to your comments. Um, but uh, as I'm uh, reading in the area, some things are, are striking to me that I think might be useful uh, to us in uh, figuring out what's happening in our current copyright system. So classical narrative, if you remember English 101 or your uh, high school English course, um, uh, Going back all the way to Aristotle makes assumptions about stories and narratives and how things are told, right? There's supposed to be a plot, it's supposed to uh, have events that happen sequentially in some sort of uh, internal chronology. It may be reference to external chronologies. Um, there's some sort of causality going on uh, in the story that uh, things happen because other things happened. Um, uh, you have characters, uh, protagonists, and antagonists that you identify with, that you don't identify with. Uh, point of view, all those sorts of things that we're familiar with uh, from storytelling. And uh, you know, Rebecca's pointed out in some of her work, I think very uh, uh, persuasively, that the paradigm case for copyright is uh, text, right? And, you know, there's a sort of uh, storytelling of this sort. Um, but we find it in other areas, certainly in audiovisual works, uh, you know, and if you uh, wonder about uh, other kinds of copyrightable works on this uh, classically, uh, things like sculpture, graphics, fine art, and so on, uh, tended to be snapshots of narrative. Right? You know, so we sort of see the moment in the story of Oedipus and the Sphinx. And, uh, in fact, that some people think that's the reason that uh, mythological and allegorical uh, subjects were so common in the 18th and 19th century. It's like everybody sort of knows that story. Or, uh, more recently, you know, Norman Rockwell, you sort of look at the illustration, you go, know, oh, I. Uh, you know, I, I recognize the family of Thanksgiving or whatever it is, and it's sort of the American uh, story, and, and you identify with that as uh, sort of a cross-section of narrative. So I think this works in a lot of different, uh, different copyrightable media. Um, then you get to, of all things, computer games. Uh, and uh, other types of digital media, the, the, the sort of broken the computer game area, uh, in particular a guy named Ted Friedman, um, uh, almost 20 years ago now, wrote a very influential piece. Uh, he was interested in uh, games uh, that you may remember. Uh, they exist in different forms now, but like SimCity uh, or Civilization, where he said, you know, from a narrative perspective, things are unfolding, right? It seems like there's a, you know, like there's a, a story in some very broad sense of story going on there. Um, but it doesn't have any of those other kinds of classical things that I, that I listed for you, right? There's not really a plot, uh, or if there's a plot, it could go a lot of different directions if you've ever played SimCity or The Sims or, or, or these kinds of games. Um, it really doesn't have protagonists. I mean, there's, there, there aren't characters that the player really identifies with. 
uh, you end up identifying these stuff with what he calls cognitive maps, which are sort of uh, these uh, visual depictions of uh, new civilizations, new lands, uh, uh, things that you're building. Um, and he sort of started with that and looked at other types of video games, other types of uh, computer games, and he said, I think we've got a a uh, whole new different type of um, work here um, that has narrative, but it can't be narrative in the way that we, uh, the way that we used to think about it. Uh, and he referred to this as, uh, in his analysis, as the cybernetic circuit. Uh, he said something emerges here, right? Some type of narrative or storytelling emerges here from the interaction and intersection between uh, the player, right? because if you're a player of a computer game, you are generating uh, different outcomes, different outputs, uh, different plot lines, if you, if you want to use that in a very loose sense, um, uh, in connection with the content that an author or coder or uh, developer has created. Um, uh, also in connection with the system, the technical system, right? Because you, uh, if you're playing a computer game, uh, the constraints of the system have something to do with that. This is before Lessig, this is not before Latour. I mean, so it's, uh, uh, you can think of this as being an aspect of, of you know, what we now call code in the Les Lessigian, is that a word? Lessigian sense. Mm -hmm. um, and these things come together uh, and interact with each other to produce a new type of work, right? Um, uh, in a sense, he says, you know, we always used to think about the interaction between uh, a reader and text in ways that Tsar talked about yesterday. Uh, uh, reader response theory has been around for a long time, and uh, the reader you know, sort of infuses the text with meaning, sure. Um, but uh, things like books, things like painting sculptures, they're relatively static. Right? We didn't uh, have what we may have now with uh, digital and similar types of media, where um, it's far more interactive than uh, mental effects, right? uh, to use Chris's term. Um, you know, you're, it's actually hands-on, you're creating a new storyline, you're creating new characters, you're creating new outcomes uh, as you go along. And so he said that it seems as if the, uh, the reader or player or user of the medium is now a co-creator, uh, not just a co-creator with the developer of the content, you know, the game that you're playing, uh, perhaps that software or that kind of code, uh, but also, as I said, the technical system uh, in something like the sense that Donna Haraway talks about of, of being a cyborg, right? It's all sort of connected to generate a uh, certain type of output. Um, that, as I said, had a huge effect on uh, analysis of new media. Right? So there are lots of interesting uh, studies now of various types of hypertext, of the World Wide Web, you know, how does that fit into this uh, paradigm. Uh, really interesting stuff for our purposes, uh, dealing with DVDs. Uh, so the number of people say, you know, once you put skip and fast forward controls into the hands of the viewer, um, the DVD now becomes uh, this type of cybernetic circuit uh, generated work um, that's not the director's cut that the director intended. Uh, and I read that, and you hear that, and you think, oh, yeah, you know, clear play, clean flicks. Uh, we actually have some copyright cases trying to deal with that problem. Uh, and Espen Arseth uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Denmark took this even further. He talks about uh, classes of what he calls cyber text that aren't even necessarily always digital uh, texts. Um, that uh, he says are configurative rather than interpretive, right? The, the reader has to exert effort to be involved uh, with the text. Uh, he refers to this as cybernetic intercourse, which sounds a little risque, but uh, we get the sense of, of, of the interactivity uh, that we're talking about. Now, um, that strikes me as being interesting and useful uh, in thinking about a number of cases that we are familiar with, and I, I don't have time to do more than one, but the, the one that immediately pops to my mind, perhaps you, yours is, uh, Alice Kaczynski's uh, opinion in MicroStar versus FormGen. You may remember that in the MicroStar case, uh, we had a, a computer game, uh, Duke Nukem in 3D, there's Duke in all his glory, um, and uh, a fairly common video game architecture, right? There was a library of images <coughs> for audiovisual output. There was a game engine, the software that sort of uh, generates the, uh, the output according to instructions in what were called map files. Map files are essentially uh, lines of code that tell the game engine when and where to place items from the, uh, from the library. And the, the developer, uh, as, as part of a marketing strategy, encouraged uh, users to develop uh, extra levels and extra versions of the, uh, of the game 
uh, in other words, to write new map files that would draw on the library and use the game engine, uh, and to trade them uh, online. Uh, and someone came along and scooped a whole bunch of them up and put them available on a, uh, on a disc. Uh, and uh, the game developer didn't like that, so soup. The problem, of course, is that the map files don't, on their face, have any content that belongs to the game developer. Uh, and they weren't written by the game developer, right? They were written by players. So what interest does the uh, game publisher have here? And I said, well, these are, in some sense, derivative works. And uh, Kaczynski jumps through a lot of hoops to try and get to that kind of result. He says, well, uh, these uh, map files uh, are derivative works in, in the sense that they're somehow sequels to the game, <laughs> right? And he, tre he, tre he calls them stories. They're new stories about Duke Nukem. Uh, they're new narratives about Duke Nukem. Now, that's a very weird version of uh, talking about stories or derivative works or, or narratives, right? Because there's actually no content there, right? There's some lines of code that tell uh, where the content goes. Um, uh, so there may be potential narratives. Um, and if you think about it in terms of the cybernetic circuit, right, the Ted Friedman approach, um, uh, you realize that, uh, uh, you know, sort of misquote or take a line from Stanley Fish, uh, you know, texts don't read themselves, games don't play themselves either, right? This only become narratives, only become stories, um, as Friedman would say, number one, in the context of the technical system, right, you've got to have the uh, game library and the game engine and the rest of the system uh, the hardware there to, to play the game, and you've got to have the player generating, uh, generating that out, but actively involved in that, um, which strikes me as a much more sensible way to think about it than the way that Kaczynski ended up thinking about it uh, in the case. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about some other cases, but there are a number of others. For example, I, I mentioned in, the, in passing uh, Clear Play, right? I think you can think much more sensibly about what's going on in the DVD uh, situation uh, with Clear Play by using this type of approach uh, than. Uh, the analysis that uh, we actually uh, saw in, in the litigation. Um, so uh, my sense is, uh, uh, so this is very beginning, very beginning of the project, but there's uh, some useful work that's been done in narratology and in literature theory um, that actually helps us think about digital uh, works in ways that we haven't before, uh, because there's some other people have been trying to struggle with this question of digital works in the cybernetic circuit for a while. Uh, and so I'm going to stop there. Uh, because that leaves me with a little bit of time to think about uh, where I go from here, right? Um, is this very reductionist, right? You just have to sort of break things down to their smallest um, uh, unit. Um, and I'm very interested in the problem of unstable text, right? If you've got a cybernetic circuit uh, and you're sort of generating uh, new plots and new things on the fly, uh, the best way I can think of to think about that is uh, uh, some of you, like Mark, are, are uh, typing on your computer um, that's continually storing drafts, right? Um, where does uh, copyright attach, and how do you think about that in terms of uh, the cybernetic circuit? So I will uh, take some questions for the last few minutes I have, and hopefully you can all set me on the right path. Uh, I think Kaczynski actually raises a really tough question that's not at all dependent on at least the digital cybernetic circuit, which is uh, in his Garcia dissent, he says, well, what about, you know, the film clips on the floor, right, the dailies? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I don't want to get too Ecclesiastes on you, but um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like these are problems that are not actually cybernetic, that they are problems yes. of reading. So DVD skip. Um, I have a lot of books that fall open to certain parts. Uh, that's, I, that's the part I like to reread. Yes. Uh, it may only be the RAM copy doctrine that has sort of made these noticeable in any way. Um, and I'm not sh so so when you say like it helps us think about clear play, what do you want us to do when we think about clear play? Um, so first of all, I think you're exactly right. I mean, and, and this is sort of what we've seen in the literature narratology uh, area is. Um, sort of broke open with computer games and digital works, and then people like uh, like Arset said, "Wait a minute, this isn't just digital uh, works. We've actually been <coughs> all, all along, but it's not as noticeable in ink smeared on dead trees uh, or, or oil smeared on canvas. Uh, but it's always been there, and we need to think about it. So uh, that's well, that's exactly what I want us to do, right? So we start thinking about hard cases like." Uh, Microstar or about uh, the clear pit toy case. Um, but then I think uh, you can actually work backwards and maybe the problems weren't as profound when we dealt with uh, paper text or when we dealt with canvas or, or wood. 
Um, but we start to realize, oh, there's always been some type of cybernetic circuit going on there, interaction between the reader, user, uh, author, coder, content producer, and the, the technology. And we need to think about uh, copyright in that way. Maybe it wasn't as obvious previously. It's just that it uh, sort of surfaced and became obvious in the, uh, in the digital context. I think I, I agree with you on that. Chris, right. so uh, I mean, yeah, I think, effects, man. Yeah, so I think this is all. I mean, it's all about authorship, right? Yeah. So you know, I, I want. It is very closely connected. To right. So I want. So I mean, so the questions I want to ask are questions about how this impacts our questions of who the author is. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that certainly in the context of the current video game market, these are going to become active, litigated issues very soon. Right, as, I hope know, so, because I want to get cited. You will. Right? <laughs> because, you know, they, you know, people are now making a lot of money playing video games on television. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's not television. It's all right. You know, so, uh, and to what extent do we need to uh, you know, rethink what it is those people are doing uh, when they're engaged in those games that might constitute uh, protectable authorship? Right. So, uh, are they you know, are they interacting in a way that we think is important, such that if you know the copyright author screwed up, you know the game author, you know had a bad lawyer who forgot to get someone to sign up, you know a license. Yeah. So that's exactly how I came to Friedman and Arsa and all the other people, uh, Manovich and all the people who have written about this was. Um, I mean, I was sort of knew that we took a wrong turn uh, back in the eighties with the with the uh, arcade game cases, you know, Winters and all the others. Um, uh, and it's become very apparent to me that that's, that's the case because of uh, current uh, trends that, that you're talking about, right? Um, you know, the uh, Blizzard has in fact said this about Warcraft. So, you know, okay, if you're uh, playing our game on Twitch or on television or whatever, that's our content. You know, like we develop right. the software, we develop the uh, audiovisual output. Um, and the players go, well, well, wait a minute, it's true that we are using your content in some sense, but we are generating new outputs. So we think that we ought to be joint authors or authorized derivative works because we're doing it with permission or something like that. Right? And I've written a little bit about that in the past, um, but it's not very satisfying to think of it that way. So I think the way that we start to think about authorship here um, is, yes, you've got to have some sort of interaction between, uh, yes, a content producer, but uh, also, especially in the video game space, the player, and then maybe the, the, the technical system as well, right? um, which means we end up with a very different uh, version of authorship. Know, not the romantic author, not the soul genius, um, but a lot of collaboration. Uh, when you sit and watch tw Twitch TV, sure, I'm seeing uh, images that originated with Blizzard, uh, or if I'm playing Duke Nukem, I see images that originated with uh, FormGen, but they're being arranged and, and manipulated by somebody else who uh, is not the sole author, but is a, in some sense a contributing author. We need to think about that in a doctor. So why do you think authorship is the right place to answer the Twitch question, rather than scope of rights? So if you could decide ex post that, given economics, this is the way you want the rights to be allocated, and that uh, they have the right to sell the games, but if people want to put their playing of the games on TV, my kid watches that all the time. He'll watch it for 24 hours a day if I'd let him. Yeah. Um, but it's always the good gamers or the entertaining gamers that make the difference more than whatever game that they're playing. So why is that really an authorship issue instead of an allocation of rights issue? So authorship is the obvious place to go, but I think you're right. It's not the only place that you can push down on this, right? I mean, there are a number of other places where we can sort of take Friedman's analysis and say, well, you can sort of start at the inception, you know, and, and change authorship, but if you want to leave authorship alone, and that, that creates other problems, I think, um, yeah, you might be able to change it uh, with, uh, when you get to substantial similarity or when you get to fair use or when you know, get somewhere else. Um, I think that uh, we need to think through the policy on that because, you know, sort of the further downstream you get, the, the, the less and less uh, of a global fix you get, right? But if you only need a tiny tweak, you know, you can take the same analysis and do something a little further downstream. Yes, I agree. Bob? So, to build on what Glenn just said, when I think of narrative and how we think about narrative, the question I come to is authenticity. You know, you can start with something like the Bible, right? And all the interpretations that religious traditions um, have used in terms of the Bible, and the question is, are they authentic? Now that's like the oldest version, right? But what, what I don't know if authenticity is really applicable here. Glenn's question made me think that it's really not a question of authenticity. It's really more a question of, 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 of that allocation of you know, perhaps economic rights. So, so what do so, you think about that? So I think that's, that's the right question, or part of the right question. 
Uh, in fact, I've been rereading Walter Benjamin because of that. Uh, I'm Barton Beebe, but ooh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, that, that's really what he talks about. Um, and he talks about it as being a political decision, uh, which is right. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, authenticity has a particular uh, connection to the romantic author that I'm not sure works here. Mm -hmm. So I haven't completely thought that through, but I think that is one of the issues. Um, it may end up that we either end up with a radically different notion of authenticity. Mm -hmm. right? um, I mean, maybe it's not authentic to say, oh, this is Blizzard's game, even though all these other people are playing it, creating this artificial algorithm. Um, maybe we need to, for authenticity purposes, to recognize both of them. Or maybe it goes by the wayside, at least in some cases. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for it? Yes, Mike. So this is a great paper. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but a couple of I yeah, guess the, the fundamental <laughs> question is is how essential is narrative to the theory? Because you can sit this piece of the circuit in, in, in the rhetorical label. So reader, what if that we treat reader as performer or performer as athlete, right? So the Twitch case pushes on this distinction between performers who contribute might contribute to a narrative and athletes who we treat, right? So dancers mm -hmm. perform choreography, players carry out a, a sports play, we tend to treat them differently. Mm -hmm. Twitch asks why, right? Really puts pressure on why. And we can think about a sporting contest as a kind of story, yes. right? Um, yes. That is being performed, yes. but it doesn't fit as neatly into the way you're talking about narrative. Well, and, and I think that's exactly right. So as I said, I'm, I'm sort of heavily influenced here by, by uh, uh, Rebecca's Harvard piece. Um, because what Friedman is saying is, um, we've got narrative all wrong, right? You know, there are other kinds of narrative that aren't the traditional narrative that may be baked into uh, how we think about copyright. Text being a paradigm case. And if we start to think about first digital media and then other stuff, maybe we need to revisit sports uh, performances. Uh, we make them with a different concept of narrative that doesn't fit copyright and fix copyright. Thank you.